Are you an existential nihilist? If so, you should read The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway. Before we get to the review, I need to answer two questions. The first of is, did I enjoy reading the book? And as a Gen X nihilist, it doesn't matter if I enjoyed the book or not. And the second question is, do I ever want to reread The Sun Also Rises? And the answer is no. Maybe. Whiskey and Literature, where we read and discuss the greatest books of all time, the best stories that have ever been put to paper, and occasionally the worst books, and all those in between, because all the stories are ours. And while we're turning those pages, we're sipping those bottles, those finely distilled spirits. I'm your host, Captain Mike. Thanks for being with me today. Last year, I watched a YouTube video on the 50 greatest books of all time, and I decided to read all of them in 20. 23 and added two for good measure to get the 52 books in 52 weeks and I started this YouTube channel to share my experiences and reviews with you. This is my seventh review of the year. The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway. I was aware of Hemingway in the way that I'm aware of Beethoven or Monet. I've heard their names and but I'm relatively unfamiliar with their works. And also when I said I would not want to reread this book again, I might could go back to it someday, but I definitely would like to read some more Hemingway, maybe A Farewell to Arms or For Whom the Bell Tolls. Have you read any Hemingway? If you have, let me know. What do you think? What should be my next Hemingway book? And of course, I don't have time this year, but possibly next year, I'll go back to a Hemingway. And speaking of Hemingway, let's talk about the author for just a moment. Again, I was fairly unfamiliar with him and his works. He's an American author. He was a journalist. He was in the war. He was born in 1899 and he died in 1961. And just as a side note, he actually committed suicide while he was living in Idaho. And his own life experiences were the basis for quite a few of his books. And I'm finding as I'm reading through these classic works this year, that is a common theme. Oftentimes the authors, if they're not the main character in the story, the events and places and things that occur are based on the author's lives. And this book is no exception. Hemingway's own expatriate life in Paris, a trip to Pamplona and a fishing trip were all the main events in this book and taken almost directly from his life. And before we turn to the book, I need to answer a quirky question for the author. Would I like to sit down with Ernest Hemingway and have a nice pour of whiskey? Well, if he's anything like the main character of his book here, I would be doing all the talking and he would certainly be able to drink me under the table. But I would love to sit down with Ernest Hemingway and talk about bullfighting and fishing and life in general. And now for the specs and stats of the Sun Also Rises. This was first published in 1926. I read this 236 book club edition uh, copy of The Sun Also Rises in one day. I had ordered a different version of the book from Amazon and it took so long to get to me, I forgot that I had ordered it and I ordered this one as well. This is certainly not a very lovely copy of the book. It was very serviceable. Uh, everything was really good with it, except I think the spine, the, not that it really matters, right? But when it sits on my shelf, it's, it's backwards. All my other books are this way. So it sits funny on my shelf and it just kind of annoys me. But uh, a perfectly good copy for reading the book. And I listened to less than the first half of the book on Audible and I did a flight to Arizona a couple of days ago and I read the entire rest of the book on the flight. It's a quick read, either way you go on Audible or if you read the book, six hours and 35 minutes on Audible, this copy and I'm sorry, and on Audible, the book does cost $4.99. It's read by Joseph Wyckoff, the version that I listened to. He was a narrator and he did a, a great job. 
I would listen to him all day. And one of the reasons that this book is such a quick read, like I said, it's 236 pages, at least the one that I have, but it reads more like a 150 page book. There's quite a bit of dialogue in the book and maybe you can or can't see it, but each line of dialogue, it's a different paragraph. Whereas if you read like David Copperfield, it would have whole conversations, even with different people, all in the same paragraph. So it was very dense, the type. And this 230 page book reads like a 150 page book. You can blaze through this easily in one day. Okay, on to the whiskey of the week. And I'm pretty excited about this one. Obviously I've had some of this. Eagle Rare, the 10 year old Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. I have three bottles of this at my house right now. It's been difficult to find in the past couple of years. I'm starting to see, I'm starting to see it more and more on the shelf these days. And I do pick up a bottle pretty much whenever I see one in the store. This is a uh, Buffalo Trace product. It is again, 10 years old. The mash bill is unknown. There was rumored to be about 10% rye. It is the same mash bill number one from Buffalo Trace as Buffalo Trace, but Buffalo Trace is only seven to nine years old. No one really knows, it's non-age stated, but Eagle Rare is at least 10 years old. And they're both the same proof. This is a 90 proof. Used to be a single barrel product, and now they move that from the label because of the way they bottle it now. It's very possible you could have, or it's possible. It's still pretty much a single barrel product, but they don't label it that way because sometimes uh, whiskeys from two different barrels might possibly get into the same bottle. So it's not labeled that anymore. When I looked at the website, they had taken the 10 year age statement from the front of the bottle and the single barrel designation and the single barrel designation is gone and the age 10 years, at least on the website and all the ones that I've seen, it's in the back but all of my bottles, they have the aged, aged 10 year statement on the front of the bottle as well. And I don't know why that is with my bottles, but, uh, but so it is. Again, I have three bottles and I'm ashamed to say that very early last year, I couldn't find Eagle Rare anywhere to save my life, except in bundles and they wanted a lot of money for those. I found one bottle by itself and I'm a little embarrassed, please don't yell at me. Uh, I paid $160 for that bottle because I really, really wanted a bottle. Late last year, I found another bottle for $80 and I picked that up and I felt decent about that. And my last bottle that I picked up um, two weeks ago, $59.99. That's a little above MSRP, but not enough. And I would pay $59.99 for this bottle all day, every day, and feel really good about it. It's a great bourbon. Um, certainly at $59, no one ever feels bad about that. Let's see, uh, tasty notes. Let's see. It says uh, sweet and oaky, maybe some hints of toffee and orange peel on the taste. It says complex body, definitely a bourbon, not much rye in there. It's really nice, a little sweet. 10 years at least, so definitely maybe a bit of an oak in there. This is my first whiskey of the day. You're gonna be able to tell that when I drink it. It's not a spectacular bourbon, but it's pretty good. If you had to drink Eagle Rare for your, the rest of your life and that's all you could have, you would not be sad about that. So if you can find some Eagle Rare, it's certainly at $59, you should pick it up. Okay guys, if you appreciate the content, like the video. And if you wanna see more of my reviews and more of the whiskeys, subscribe to my channel. Back to the sun also rises and onto the plot and structure of the book. This is a Roman Clay Clef book, a book with a key or a novel with a key. It's basically a true story with a facade of fiction overlaid on top of it. This was Hemingway's first novel. 
and by some literary critics is considered to be his best work. And here he fully explores his iceberg theory, which he adapted from his time as a journalist, where he writes without explanation, without context or exploring meanings. There's hardly an adjective to be found in this book. Compare that to someone like Tolkien, who takes three pages to describe the bark of a tree. One thing that has stuck out to me as I've been reading, and this is my seventh book that I've read this year so far, is how different these are from what I'm used to reading and how distinct they are from each other. Typically, sometimes I'll read something like Stephen King, and I'll read just Stephen King for six months, or I'll read science fiction or fantasy. I'll read all of the Tom Clancy books, Jack Ryan, for several months, and then I can't stand it again or go back to that same genre or the same author for sometimes for a couple of years because I just plummet to depth for a while and I need something different. This year, as I'm reading all the different books from Midnight's Children to Magic Mountain to Leaves of Grass to Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, Tristram Shandy, and now Hemingway, The Sun Also Rises, I'm really enjoying this because each book is very different from the one previous and it's so it's fresh and always different and I'm learning and this book is very different than all the other books. I mean, how wordy is Magic Mountain? How wordy and nonsensical is Tristram Shandy? Midnight's Children, Magic Realism? This is nothing to do. There's no magic realism in this novel at all. And at first as I was reading it, I was not sure I was liking it, but as I finished it and I sit on it, I appreciate it more and more as time goes along. Okay, let's go through the plot real quick. And it's, again, a fairly short book, so a fairly short plot. We follow a group of expatriates in Paris in 1924. They are American, British, Scottish. There's some other minor characters. There's a Greek count, there's a Parisian prostitute, and there's a Spanish bullfighter and other more minor characters throughout the book. Jake and Brett, Lady Ashley, are the two main characters, and we peek into their daily dissipated lives. Many of the men in the book are veterans, and this does give them a bond, but their wounds, both physical and mental, carry through to their daily meaningless lives, and they're referred to as the lost generation. Okay, so I was trying to explain to Mrs. Captain kind of the plot of the book and how it happened and who were the main characters. And it got pretty convoluted as I was telling her about all the different characters in the book. And I thought a whiteboard would be nice. Now, if I was more tech savvy, I would do this digitally, but it would take me a couple weeks to figure out how to do that. So we're going to do the whiteboard here as we explain who's in the book and what their relationships are. So Lady Ashley, Brett, is kind of almost the main character. The story's told by Jacob Barnes. Jake, he's the narrator in the story. It's, we see things through his eyes. And everyone else is another major and minor characters. So let's talk. Lady Ashley and Jake, they love each other. So they definitely have a bond and it goes back and it goes forth. There is love both ways. Jake was wounded in the war and is impotent. There's no description of what exactly happened, whether that was mental or physical. We don't know. We don't know, but it doesn't work. Lady Ashley, she likes to get it on. She is described, I'll read this in the book. There's not much uh, description in some respects in this novel. Not many adjectives, but Brett, she, Brett was damned good looking. She wore a slip over jersey sweater and a tweed skirt and her hair was brushed back like a boy's. She started all that. She was built with curves like the hull of a racing yacht and you missed none of it with that wool jersey. I was telling Mrs. Captain about her and she's like, well, what color is her hair? And I said, actually, I don't know. Um, maybe it describes it in there, but I don't actually know. I can't tell you what color her hair is, but 
She's built like the whole of her racing yacht. They love each other, but she likes to get it on. He can't get it on. So nothing's really happening there other than they spend a lot of time with each other. And this is the main relationship in the story. Now, Jake introduces, he knows Robert Cohen, and he introduces Robert to Lady Ashley. And Robert falls in love with Lady Ashley. But Lady Ashley just likes to get it on. And so while she does with Robert, she doesn't love him at all, except physically a few times. Robert married to Francis. Francis loves Robert, or she, she loves the stability and the money. Well, I'm not really sure. Robert doesn't really love Francis, though he still stays with her and they're married. Georgette is a Parisian prostitute that Jake meets one night. He doesn't really love her, of course. He just meets her and she wanted to do some business with him, but again, he can't get it on. So he took her to a nightclub where she met some of the other characters and presumably hung out and then he left and left her there. So there's nothing really going on there. She was just a minor character and apparently she's very pretty when she wasn't smiling with her mouth open. Count Mipopopoulos. I actually really liked him. I thought he was a great character. So Lady Ashley introduces us to him. So he really likes Lady Ashley and she really likes him. But do they love each other? No. They're just using each other for what they have. Her good looks and his money and his love of champagne and good wine. And he pops in and out of the story a couple times. And I really liked this character. He was great. The conversation was good. His wine apparently was really good. I enjoyed that relationship and when he popped in. That was a great time. So we meet Mike, who's a friend of Jake. And they're all friends. And actually, Mike is Lady Ashley's intended. They're going to get married. So Mike kind of loves Lady Ashley and she kind of loves him, but it doesn't seem very strong to me because Lady Ashley is actually married to Lord Ashley. They don't love each other at all. They're getting divorced. So that's going to end. And she's going to marry Michael because she can't marry Jake because he's impotent. Do they love each other? Maybe kind of. Bill, he's a friend of Jake's as well. And they go fishing together. Bill seemed like a really nice guy. I like He was a great character and everything. So Bill and Harris, they meet. So when Jake and Bill go fishing, they meet Harris. And they have a wonderful time while they're fishing in this little town somewhere. And Harris is so taken by Jake and Bill that he gives them some flies that he tied himself so that they would rem remember him by later when they use those flies. Okay, so basically everybody in this whiteboard, they all lead meaningless lives. Nihilistic, which just means that, meaningless, without reason, without course. There's, they're going about their daily lives with no purpose. Fatalistic, except for Pedro Romero. Who is he? He's a Spanish bullfighter, 19 years old, and he looks damn good in blue pants. What happens? Lady Ashley, she sees Pedro Romero, and she instantly falls in love. Jake and Mike, I believe, meet Pedro one day at the hotel, where they're all staying at the same hotel. And so they introduce Lady Ashley, or Jake introduces Lady Ashley to Pedro. And he, as well, instantly is smitten and falls in love. She's 34 years old, he's 19, and they get it on because Lady Ashley likes to. Everyone, nihilistic, meaningless, their lives purposeless, no reason for living, except Pedro Romero. He's a bullfighter, he's passionate about it. He has something to live for. He is different than all the other characters. Unsullied, clean, beautiful. 
So basically, these guys are all in Paris. They're leading their lives. Jake, Mike, I'm sorry, Jake and Bill go fishing on the way to Pamplona. They decide to meet there for the running of the bulls and the festival. They meet Harris. They have a wonderful time. And then these two go on to Pamplona where they meet up with Ashley, Mike, Robert, and that's that. So they're there as they're enjoying the festival. Lady, our brat meets Pedro. They have a quick affair. Fist fights, fisticuffs, feelings hurt. Robert finally gets that he's not wanted. He's not part of the group. He leaves. Brett and Pedro, Romero, they leave. Pedro wants to marry Brett. He wants her to grow her hair out longer and basically domesticate her. Jake, after the festival, he goes to San Sebastian. And I love this part of the story. He is just enjoying himself, winding down after all the events and everything that was happening and the bullfighting and the fist fighting. And he gets a telegram from Brett. He said, come Jake, please come. I need your help. He gets on the train. He goes to where she's at. She tells him that she was with Pedro and he wanted to domesticate and to marry her. And of course she can't give him that. So she made him go away. I'm going to read from you the last page of the book. So they met and they were talking. Downstairs, we came out through the first floor dining room to the street. A waiter went for a taxi. It was hot and bright. Up the street was a little square with trees and grass where there were tar taxis parked. A taxi came up the street, the waiter hanging out at the side. I tipped him and told the driver where to drive and got in beside Brett. The driver started up the street. I settled back. Brett moved close to me. We sat close together against each other. I put my arm around her and she rested against me comfortably. It was very hot and bright and the houses looked sharply white. We turned out onto the Grand Via. Old Jake, Brett said. We could have had had such a damned we could have had such a damned good time together. Ahead was a mounted policeman in khaki directing traffic. He raised his baton. The car slowed suddenly, pressing breath against me. Yes, I said. Isn't it pretty to think so? That's how this book was. Short, sparse dialogue, simple scenes, not deeply described, but you still had a vivid image of what was happening. You could see it in your mind, the bright, hot day, the white building, the taxi, the policeman. Not a lot of words, but a fantastic story. Okay, so what were my thoughts on The Sun Also Rises? I was unsure about this book when I was reading it and after I had just finished it. But as I had gone on some time and it's been a couple days since I finished it and it's been marinated in my mind, I appreciate it more and more and more. I appreciated the Spartan language in this book through tight descriptions. Hemingway's love for the outdoors, the entire fishing sequence I adored and his appreciation and understanding and affection for bullfighting really shone bright in this book. My expectations coming into this book, my first Hemingway, was I thought I would see war, bullfighting, and drinking. And we got two of the three. We got bullfighting and we got drinking on every page throughout the entire book. They were always tight. That's the rest of their description for being drunk. I'm so tight, but I get the Hemingway. It's not for everybody. He's not for everyone. And I think the first rule of reading is read what you like. Just like the first rule in drinking is, drink what you like. So I do understand those who bag on Hemingway. 
of the seven books that I read so far this year, three of them I did not enjoy. And while I might not return to The Sun Also Rises, I am definitely going to read some more Hemingway, though not this year, next year. And the great thing is if I do actually decide to return to The Sun Also Rises is that it's such a short book, it's a quick read, and I'll just blaze right through it. So I think that if you have not read a Hemingway, you should read Hemingway, and The Sun Also Rises would be a fantastic start. Okay, last thing before we wrap up today. Next up is Collected Fictions from Jorge Luis Borges. I've been excited for this book. It's my only Argentine book this year, and I love everything to do with Argentina. I've already read about 10 or 12 of the stories in this book. They're all pretty short stories. There's got to be 60 or 70 short stories in here. And I'm excited to get all the way through the book, and the review will be coming up. All right, my friends, I hope you're reading something good, drinking something good, turn those pages, and stay thirsty.